You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film, A Place at the Table, about the Black pioneers of Silicon Valley. Through Cotton Tales Podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Damian Rassan. Damien is a senior scientist and the computer languages and systems software group lead at Berkeley Lab, where he researches parallel programming models for high performance computing and deep learning. He also founded and led Archaeologic, a consultancy specializing in software archaeology, which involves modernizing legacy scientific software and sorcery institute a not-for-profit engage in computational science and engineering education. I am so glad that we ha- will be able to spend this time together, Damien. Looking over your bio, it is clear that you are one busy man. I have so many balls in the air that, you know, there are things that just aren't even mentioned there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Currently, I'm 75% time at Berkeley Lab, and in the other 75% of my time, I'm basically running like four businesses. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <yes. laughs> People only know about two or three, but depending on what you want to get into, I can talk about them all. And I think <sighs> your focus is science, so of the four, only two are related to science. And which ones are those now? Are they nonprofits or profits? So there's both. There's a, the nonprofit is called Sorcery Institute, and mm-hmm. sorcery is spelled like source code, so mm-hmm. S-O-U-R-C-E-R-Y. Mm-hmm. And the for-profit is called Archaeologic, so spelled just like archaeology, but archaeologic. So what are the other two, the, the profit, for-profit? So the for-profit archaeologic is mostly focused on uh, software archaeology, which Ooh. is where the name comes from. So we do a lot of work with legacy codes, uh, updating them to modern standards and modern development practices, um, and ultimately doing custom software development. Okay. Uh, so uh, we've had projects with government labs. Um, right now, our biggest pro- project is with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're modernizing a code that predicts uh, the probability of fracture in uh, nuclear reactor pressure vessels. Mm. Um, we also have a project working with uh, a, a manufacturer of auto safety equipment, and we're developing a code for them that predicts airbag deployment, mm-hmm. right? it predicts the inflator. And um, so both industry and government, uh, and in those cases, those aren't open source codes. And so that's the kind of work that we do on the for-profit side. Okay. Uh, the not-for-profit is somewhat dormant. Um, I, I actually would like to hand off most of the work in both of those and go full-time at Berkeley Lab. That's really my focus. Um, the, the not-for-profit is largely in the, in the same space as the, as the for-profit, but the difference is that it works more with the education sector and does a lot with training. Uh, we've sponsored a PhD fellowship. Uh, and had other uh, opportunities for students to do work with us um, to get trained in modern software development for science, basically. Mm-hmm. So under that PhD fellowship, um, is that like an internship for students, uh, or how do you handle it? We've, we've had a number of interns okay. decided that one of the ways to collaborate would be for the nonprofit to fund uh, a student to work with them. That student was at Cranfield University in the UK, Mm -hmm. and then I also had a student from uh, Oxford who came to work with me for 11 weeks. Basically, it's an externship. What happens is the university pays for the student to go out and work with a different organization just to get experience in something unrelated to their dissertation. So the work, you know, should not be related in any way to their dissertation research. He reached out to me and chose to come work with me for 11 weeks. 
I guess, developing a new feature set for a Fortran compiler. So I do most of my work in either in or supporting modern Fortran, which is also why I got into the software archaeology. Fortran is the oldest programming language going back to 1957 at IBM. And uh, yeah, so he was developing some new features for uh, the, a Fortran, uh, an open source Fortran compiler. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, mean, saying Fortran is the oldest. I remember back in 1976 when I was in college, we were learning Fortran. Well, I want to say you, you mentioned programming in Fortran in 1976. I wasn't too far behind you. I learned Fortran in 1979. So yes. uh, was a, a local science center. Um, I just took a one week course there in Fortran in the summer. And we worked on these terminals that had just four lines on the screen. So. I, I, I sort of imagine that if I had shown up any sooner, I would have been on punch cards, but I just barely <laughs> missed it. And how did you get into this field? Tell me about Damien. What was he like? Say, before you were 12 years old, what was going on in your well, life? Before I was 12. Yeah, oh, before wow. you got into that, yeah. that class. What made you go into a field like that? Well, my parents used to send me to this science center every summer. This was uh, Pinellas County. We lived in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh -huh. And it was the Pinellas County Science Center, which, by the way, uh, has hit upon some hard times. I think they've actually shut down for a bit. My brother is now a state senator in St. Petersburg, and he's been raising some funds to reopen it and you know, engage the local youth in science again. Uh -huh. um, so I had been going to that science center every summer for several years. The things that I most remember prior to then was building model rockets and paper airplanes and things like that. It's, I didn't even have any idea about growing up to do anything like that. <laughs> but it just so happened that one of my classmates uh, in seventh grade, his dad was driving us to school and he worked at um, Pratt & Whitney. Uh, they make aircraft engines. And he was telling us about the tests that he would run at the lab on jet engines. Mm -hmm. And that was the, when the light bulb first went on. And, oh, you can grow up to do this kind of stuff as a job. The programming, I think, really fascinated me to the point that when I was in 10th grade, or 10th grade, I remember taking the PSAT and they asked you to fill out, you know, what you think, what career you think you'd like to go into. And I think I put down a systems administrator, uh, the only job title I knew in computer science, and, you know, what you wanted to study in college. And I put down computer science as well. Mm -hmm. But then by the time I was... Uh, in 12th grade, I had taught myself like three programming languages. So I'd done Fortran uh, and then Basic. And all of this was kind of just fortuitous. I mean, the only reason I learned Basic was because I came back from that summer experience of learning Fortran to find that my school at the time uh, didn't have a Fortran compiler, but they were teaching Basic. So I taught myself Basic. Okay. I didn't want to wait to take the class, you know. I was writing uh, video games, and someone told me that my games would run faster if I wrote them in assembly language. Mm -hmm. So assembly language is just about the lowest level language on the computer was because my mom was a writer. She wrote a newspaper column, okay. and so she bought an Apple II Plus for the word processing. She knew that I was programming on it, but I couldn't figure out a way to explain to her what an assembler was, so I couldn't get her to buy me an assembler. <laughs> So, but then someone explained to me that, well, what you can do is you can write machine language, which is one level down from the assembly language. And they explained to me that if you, if you wrote in the machine language, that, then the Apple came with a disassembler for free. So you could write the machine language, just disassemble it to see the assembly language, which, which is much easier to read. And so that's why I taught myself machine language. Okay. So, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, since I had already learned three languages, I thought, oh, well... Why study computer science? I already know this field. And, you know, in <laughs> retrospect, I realized how silly that was. There's a lot more to computer science than just learning a few programming languages. Yeah. Uh, but I decided I would go into my first love before computers. It was aerospace engineering. My, I come from a family with a very strong tradition of attending uh, historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. Mm -hmm. My parents met at Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. And my two oldest siblings went to Xavier. And then the, my two siblings after them went to Howard. And so they really wanted me to go to Howard because I wanted to study engineering and Xavier didn't have an engineering program. Mm -hmm. 
I looked at the catalog for Howard, I didn't see aerospace engineering, so I wasn't thinking I was going to go there. But one of my sisters, fortunately, was you know undeterred, and she took me to the campus anyway, and marched me over to the engineering school. Somehow we found our way to the mechanical engineering department, where I got to meet, as a high school student, I got to meet the chair of mechanical engineering uh, at Howard, who later became a mentor in my career, much later. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me at the time that you know, even though Howard didn't have an aerospace major, they had an aerospace concentration within mechanical engineering. And he also explained to me that aerospace is tied to a specific industry, whereas mechanical engineers take almost all the same classes as aerospace engineers, mm -hmm. but it's more of a discipline not tied to one specific industry. And so if the aerospace industry is on, you know, a down part of its economic cycle, if you're, you know, you have broader prospects if you're a mechanical engineer. And so once he explained that to me, and I had an interest in going to Howard anyway, mm -hmm. so that kind of put two and two together, and I, and I ended up deciding to go to Howard. Great. So for various reasons, I ended up staying all the way through with mechanical engineering, even though I thought a lot about other fields. Um, you know, when I was applying to grad schools, I was accepted to a PhD program in applied math, or it was called Applied and Computational Mathematics at, at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, but... Otherwise, everything I looked at was in mechanical engineering, and I ended up at Stanford, where I found a great PhD advisor. But even after he invited me to join his research group, I was still kind of looking around because I was thinking about math, and I remember going and talking to a math professor and telling him that I wanted to develop algorithms. And, you know, I had mentioned that I had a professor in my department, you know, who wanted me to work with him. And he said, well, you never really want to develop algorithms in a vacuum uh, because you could spend all kinds of time refining some piece of the algorithm that maybe doesn't even matter when you get to the real application. So he said, you want to develop algorithms in the context of an application. Hmm. So that's when, you know, the light bulb went off that I could work with this, this professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, he actually was a lab scientist. You know, he did uh, lab research. He, he had a pretty big research group, about 10 students in the group at any given time. He always would keep at least one computational student and you know, I was also the only uh, black student in the group, and one of my friends in the group, you know, used to jokingly refer to me as the token computational student. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of ended up just staying the course mm -hmm. with mechanical engineering all the way through, but I still had this love of computer science mm -hmm. and of uh, programming. Over the course of my career, I started veering in this direction, mm -hmm. and it wasn't always well supported it was actually against the advice of a lot of people close to me uh both mentors ahead of me in their careers and even students who worked with me were telling me not to focus too much on the, on the coding the worst case scenario uh, i have moved a lot of different places in my career but at one point i was at a city college of new york in a visiting faculty position and while i was there uh, i interviewed for a tenure track position but when i did that interview i gave a talk that was really more on the software engineering aspect of a mechanical engineering problem. There was a professor uh, in that interview who was really famous. This, he had taught at Stanford before and left Stanford to come to the City College of New York. Uh, this is someone who was in the National Academy of Science and you know had won the National Medal of Technology. And at the end of my job talk for this interview, he walked, like even before we got into the questions, he walked out of the room giving me the thumbs down. So. There were a lot of people telling me not to do this. <laughs> um, why, know, would they, why would they tell you? What were their reasons for not doing it? Um, that's a really good question. I yeah. think they didn't respect it. I think that, the, uh, you know, my concentration, my uh, dissertation research was in fluid dynamics. And I think in their mind, the real science the real interesting work was in the fluid dynamics and whatever however you write the code is just how you write the code it doesn't really matter but i always felt that it it did matter and that if we wrote better code we would do better science hmm. you know mm -hmm. um but that was a very controversial thing and honestly even though i was fascinated with the coding i didn't even myself know exactly what could come of it. For example, as a professor, it's important to publish. I didn't know how I would ever get papers out of that work. And then I went to a conference in 2003. It was the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, SIAM, 
conference on computational science and engineering. And I gave a talk there that I refer to as my coming out party. <laughs> Because it was the first time I had publicly, so, you know, the interview was, was one thing because that was kind of, you know, local just within this one department and, and college. But this was now at a conference, the first time I ever stood up uh, and to a broad audience gave a talk that was about the software design. So I was doing computational fluid dynamics or heat transfer, whatever the application was at the time, but I didn't talk about the fluid dynamics or heat transfer in the talk at all. It was all about the way the software was written. Mm -hmm. At the end of that talk, Charles Norton came up to me. He's an African-American physicist uh, who had written several papers that inspired my work quite a bit. So at the time, Fortran had not yet adopted the object-oriented programming paradigm that most modern languages use. It was going to in an upcoming standard, but the features weren't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And he had written several papers describing how you can emulate object-oriented programming in Fortran, even with the features that existed at the time. And I first read these papers in 1999, which is when I became a professor at City College of New York. And you know, when you're a new professor and you're thinking about starting a research program and you're recruiting students to, into your research group and you're thinking about writing a new code, one of the first big choices is what language am I going to write it in? At the time, if you were doing object-oriented programming, you were probably, especially in science, you were probably writing C++. But once I saw these papers, I saw a really nice, clear way to do the object-oriented programming in modern Fortran, mm -hmm. right? And so his papers had really launched me in this direction uh, and, and, you know, it heavily influenced how I wrote code with my graduate students. So at the end of this talk at the conference, he came up to me and said he was on the editorial board for this journal called Scientific Programming. Uh, which was a very good journal at the time. Unfortunately, these days, uh, it's gotten taken over by a new publisher and they're accepting a lot of junk. But um, he said, you should think about submitting to this journal. And I said, well, I'm not really doing anything novel. I'm just applying the techniques that I read in your papers. And he said, well, we also publish experience papers. And that was the first time I had even heard that term. You know, the idea was that I didn't necessarily have to be doing something novel in terms of the approach to the programming, but simply applying it in a new setting and describing what comes out of that setting, uh, you know, what I discover about the programming approach in that setting, you know, could be novel enough to write a paper. And so it's interesting, you know, to think that this person came my way who I think maybe not completely coincidentally, is also African-American, was a little bit ahead of me in his field, mm -hmm. and said just the thing that first made it crystallize in my brain that I could actually write a paper about this coding stuff that I was doing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Flashback to when I was in grad school in the 1990s, the chair of my dissertation committee, so when you defend your dissertation, you put together a committee, and so the person who chaired my uh, defense from outside the department was... Kunle Olakoten, um, and I can, I guess, I'll, I'll spell that for you for the recording, it's K-U-N-L-E, which is actually, his, he goes by Kunle, it's, it's short for Oye Kunle, mm -hmm. and his last name is Olakoten, O-L-U-K-O-T-U-N. And I remember um, walking across campus with him one time, and I mentioned to him that I wanted to get into software engineering as a research topic. And he said, yeah, you know, that's cool, but the problem is, what are the metrics? You know, how can you prove that one software design is, diff is better than another? You know, what measure do you have for that? And that sort of just, like, stuck in my brain, you know, for a long time. So, you know, putting these two, and, and Kunle Olakotin is also African-American. He's uh, grew up, I think, mostly in uh, the UK, his family's from Nigeria, and... Um, so the very first paper I ever published on software engineering was in the journal Scientific Programming, recommended to me by Charles Norton. Mm -hmm. And the first two words in the title of the paper were design metrics. You remember Conley had said, what are the metrics? And it was when I first started to come up with some ways to reason about the software design quantitatively um, that I thought I was, had something to, to publish. And so I do think it's really meaningful that you know these two people said these things that kind of 
led me down this path and, and, and got me going. Um, ultimately, read, wrote some more papers uh, on software engineering in that same journal and finally put them together into a book uh, that I published on Cambridge University Press in 2011 called Scientific Software Design, The Object-Oriented Way. So um, that's sort of the turning point where, okay, I've got a book out here in this field. I have several papers. You know, now I can, when I go and give a job talk, if I'm interviewing for a new job, now I can actually talk about the software engineering aspects of it unabashedly. <laughs> you know, like I've, I've got a body of work here that I can, that I can point to. And, you know, it's, it's not that I can't do the science. It's that there's also some really cool stuff to look at in the, in the code. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. what, what do you think gave you uh, that drive to look at the software differently than others? Was there anything along the way that hinted to you that possibly the software could be written or better or differently yeah. than it was? Well, I remember when I first started grad school and, you know, someone handed me a code to use in my research mm -hmm. and I couldn't even get the code to compile, right? If you can't compile it, you can't run it. And that was just one of the first experiences I had where it was like, you know, that took some time to figure out what was going wrong, and I had to go back to the person, and that was time that I could have been doing the science, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that's why I say, like, we will get more science done and better science done if we write better software, mm. right? because there's time lost to the poorly written software. Yeah. You know? so, so how do you fun. find the better written software? Do you make it up yourself? Do you experiment with uh, the... Uh, yeah. The current software, well, how do you do that? Well, the great news is that there's a lot of great open source software out there uh, in general and specifically for science. And so um, a lot of it you can discover from you know, reading the software that's put out there publicly for everyone to use. Mm -hmm. And I'd say a lot of what I learned also about software engineering practices came from when I moved to Sandia National Laboratories mm. in 2007, and I joined a big project there uh, called Trilinos, T-R-I-L-I-N-O-S. And even back then, Trilinos was about a million lines of code. I imagine it must be multiple millions of lines of code <laughs> now. But it was uh, one of the biggest open source software projects supporting science, doing things like linear algebra and you know nonlinear optimization, you know, different things like that, uh, and putting all of the code out there in, in the open and, and freely usable by the, by the public mm -hmm. uh, in order to develop something of, on, on that scale and to be used by, you know, a broad audience of, of people, you have to develop practices that lead to high quality software, you know, that has, that's, has fewer bugs and is more portable and easier to build and easier to modify and all these sorts of things. So that, I picked a lot of it up there uh, at Santia uh, as well. You know, it really is surprising to me. I've talked to other people in the in the tech field. To hear the words uh, open source right. is uh, it's kind of uh, not strange, but because of all the proprietary laws and rules, to hear open source that it's still available, do you think it's because it's such a high level that only certain people will ever really understand the mm -hmm. the the um, source at all? Well, I think a certain amount of it is what really drives the people who are developing it. Mm -hmm. you know, what I care about more than anything else is that software that I develop gets used. Um, obviously, I need to make a living, so I care about you know being able to fund the development of it. <laughs> But beyond that, beyond just the basic needs of put, putting, putting food on the table, I care a lot more about it being used than I do about making money on it, mm -hmm. right? And so I think people who are driven by that motivation tend to go with open source. And fortunately, what's happened is that the funding agencies have started to align around this. So, for example, if you have a project funded by the Department of Energy Office of, uh, Office of Science, um, I know at least with the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research, we call it OSCAR for short. Mm -hmm. uh, any fund, any research funded by that software, that by that office that produces software, the software has to be open source. It has to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think we're seeing other agencies moving in that direction. I'll have to maybe do a search and double check, but I think there are similar uh, rules at other agencies, like maybe the National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. that are beginning to require uh, software developed on their funding to be open source. It almost seems like the tech field in is saying uh, that you are a entity unto yourself and that you have to share with everyone in order for us to go to move further down this line rather than keeping it secret and no one wins. If you keep it open, then those it's allowed uh, in, innovation is allowed to happen. Is that? Well, you said tech field, maybe not as much mm -hmm. tech, but science, right? And the two are closely related, but distinct at the same time, right? So I'm talking about the work that's done at national laboratories, the work that's done at universities. Mm -hmm. Actually, however, I would say that universities are slower to embrace open source because professors are concerned about building their reputation and becoming leaders in their field, and that's how they get tenure and get promoted. Um, I would love to see academia embrace open source a lot more because I believe science would move faster if more source was open, yeah. right? Yeah. If as long as we keep things close to the vast and, and private, uh, it limits, you know, who can make the advances, who can make the developments. Well, that was, you know, the that open source uh, uh, concept, I've read now that this was one of the reasons why Silicon Valley grew so quickly is that there was symbiotic a connection between the, the university and most of the companies that were startups there. They were either involved in it or uh, helping them out with some type of technology uh, and that is why Silicon Valley can't be duplicated because in other areas such as the East Coast they tried but because of the um, I guess it's I guess they have a standard there of doing business where there is very little open source uh, that they are concerned about proprietary information, so it wasn't able to flow as evenly or easily on the yeah. East Coast as in the West Coast. Did you find yeah. anything like that happening in your research or in, while you were developing? That's a good question. I don't know to what extent. I mean, there are certainly really important and big open source projects in, in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know to what extent it's embraced broadly, though. Uh, there's there's still a lot of closed source, even in Silicon Valley, to, yeah. uh, you know. What I'm seeing is that most of the companies that develop Fortran compilers, um, you know, IBM, NVIDIA, Intel, mm -hmm. and various other companies, are either taking their existing compilers and re-engineering them so that they build on top of the LLVM back end at a low level, mm -hmm. or they're actually embracing the LLVM compiler front end and just contributing directly to that. And so basically, at least in this in the Fortran compiler world, they are all moving towards open source. Mm -hmm. um, I don't again, I don't know how much that is representative of what's happening in tech broadly, but yeah. but there are great examples of big open source projects that are having a lot of lot of impact. Well, how is, uh, is uh, or is artificial intelligence infect, affecting anything that you do? This is something that, that's fairly new to me. So I came to Berkeley Lab two and a half years ago, and I was awarded a, 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 some startup funds, basically. Uh, and so I, I had a project for two and a half years that was my first foray into AI. I had no idea I would ever do AI before coming here. That's one of the nice things about being in a scientific research setting is constantly having the, the opportunity to reinvent yourself. Yeah. You know, um, whatever you can get funded, you can do, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in this project, I, the, the original focus and still a big component of it is working, collaborating with a climate scientist to try and accelerate his climate model. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Intermediate Complexity Atmospheric Research Model, ICAR is the acronym. And 90% of the computing time when you run ICAR is in what's called the cloud microphysics model. And so the cloud microphysics basically is going to tell you at any given point or at every point in the atmospheric region that you're simulating whether liquid water or ice water will form. Mm. 
which you can then use to uh, predict precipitation. If we can train a neural network, the code that you use, that you need to actually use that neural network to do predictions is a few tens of lines of code. So much smaller, potentially much faster, uh, and actually just over the weekend, just two days ago for the first time, I was able to get the software that we're developing to train a neural network uh, to serve as a proxy for this cloud microphysics model. We haven't gotten to the point of testing it yet. We don't know for sure that it's faster than the actual model. Um, we also don't know yet how accurate the predictions are, but I can at least get the training to converge so I can see you know, uh, what we call the loss function, which is one measure of error, you know, decreasing as the training goes. So mm. it's getting more and more accurate over time. Um, so that's my first foray into, open, into, into AI. And the library that I've developed for that is called Inference Engine. So when you're using a neural network to do predictions, it's called doing inference. Mm -hmm. What's most unique about it is the fact that it's written in modern Fortran. Most of the software that people use to do uh, AI, to do deep learning these days is Python or C++ or C code. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're running these jobs, in order to get them to run fast, you have to be able to take a given program and basically replicate it, you know, uh, and so that it can run on multiple cores or, or even multiple um, nodes, multiple boxes within a big supercomputer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's called parallel computing. And there's also a feature set designed for programming graphics processing units, GPUs. And so uh, now that I've got the training working, my goal is to figure out how I can speed up the training using Fortran's parallel and GPU features. And we, because training is very expensive, training a neural network it takes a lot of compute time. So when you uh, say training, you're not talking about training a, an individual. You're actually training your systems. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so would not uh, artificial intelligence speed that whole process up for you? Well, that no, the training is artificial intelligence. I see. In, right? okay. So what you're doing, so a neural network is, you can think of it as, uh, so in deep learning, you have layers of uh, composed of nodes. Mm -hmm. The nodes are notionally somewhat like how neurons behave in the brain, so that's why it's called a neural network. Mm -hmm. And the idea is at any given layer for a fully connected network, every node in one layer is connected to every node in the next layer, right? Mm -hmm. And they send signals. And as the signal propagates through the layers, you have a set of, you have what training data that is your ground truth. So we take the cloud microphysics model, we do a climate simulation, the, the model gets a bunch of inputs, produces outputs, we capture those in a big training data set, and we, we know, okay, if the cloud microphysics model sees this input, then it gets that output, okay? And so we have these input-output pairs. Mm -hmm. We put together a big collection of those. It's like 60 gigabytes of data. And then there's a set of mathematical techniques for taking a neural network, like I described, these layers of, of, of neurons, of interconnected neurons, and training those neurons to do the exact same thing so that mm -hmm. given this input, they produce that output in exactly the way that the cloud microphysics model would. If you can get that to work, then what happens is now you can completely replace the traditional model with a neural network. That, that is AI. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's it's, one branch of AI. It sounds like the process that happened back in the 70s when they were taking, trying to develop transistors, and then over time they got smaller and smaller and faster and faster. It, right. This it, uh, AI seems like it's the software version of the hardware that happened back in the 70s and 80s. To me. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. really fascinating. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about it from that perspective. I mean, so I guess to the extent that there might be an analogy between transistors and the nodes of a neural network, that could be true. Mm -hmm. um, I say that because I remember giving a talk to a bunch of high school kids, and, and in the middle of my talk, I realized, wait a minute, the, when I started in the business, it was the room that was called a computer was a room. Yeah. And now I have the computer on my mm -hmm. hand, on yeah. my arm, or in my hand. And so right. to come from 
you know, I have this perspective of coming from this huge room to this tiny little thing. So I'm just saying it seems very, AI seems to me like the transition that was occurring with hardware back in the day. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. I'm going to have to give that a lot more thought. All right. I, well, I get, <laughs> always happy to help. <laughs> I'm wondering if, um, you know, my, I, have, I made a film called A Place at the Table, and I used that, t that, uh, that phrase because I wanted the people to visualize color at the, at the, at the table um, and that what a difference it makes. In fact, there's another line I use in my training, and that is if Apple had had a woman on the first team to build their laptop, it wouldn't have weighed 60 pounds. You know, it had they just had a woman, had she been in place. So, uh, do you can you think of some times when your being there has made a difference? Oh wow, that's fascinating. Well, mm -hmm. I think just what we're talking about right now, uh, you know, Fortran has so often been left for dead, and so I've come into settings where you know C plus plus, well, and particularly here at Berkeley Lab where C plus plus had become dominant, mm -hmm. right, uh, and increasingly Python. And there really wasn't anybody here doing much work related to Fortran. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I think about, like, why I adopted the language, and, and, and I've programmed in, you know, probably 10 different languages uh, mm -hmm. for various purposes, but, but I think a certain amount of it was that I felt some affinity for this underdog community mm -hmm. because there are so many... Uh, the Fortran is the butt of so many computer science jokes, you know. Um, you know, you can find this quote that software engineers will say, you know, you can write Fortran in any language. That's their way of saying you can write bad code in any language, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, honestly, partly because I'm African American and I'm coming from an underdog community, mm -hmm. I felt some desire to stand up. For this, <laughs> this, little, like, this little guy, right? <laughs> <you know? laughs> but isn't so, isn't that true about math in general? Though it, it doesn't matter what language you speak, you still the it's going to come out the same. Two and two is always going to equal four.